Let me pray for us, and we'll jump right into it. Father, thank you again for this chance to come together and, and to study your word. Lord, thank you for the wonderful, awesome, but extremely deep truths that you're going to be showing us tonight from your word. Lord, as I had prepared and prayed over this passage to, for tonight, I got so excited that I, 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 know, I know that I'm not going to be able to communicate the depth of this without your spirit actually communicating it. I could try. I could try to put it into words, but I thank you that it's not up to me to make it make sense. It's up to me to just share it, and your word is true. We're going to look at your scriptures, your spirits within us, those that trust you and know you as Savior. And you're going to give us understanding. And Lord, I even know that at the end of tonight, even myself, we won't all fully grasp this. But you taught us that we're to try to know the height and the width and the depth and the breadth of your love. And so, Lord, we want to dive in a little deeper tonight. Lord, for those that are listening, though maybe online or listening to the recording through the website later on, Lord, if they don't know you, may you open their eyes and their hearts to your truth. That today would be the day that they trust you as their Savior and become children of God. And can begin to experience these truths that we're going to look at. And Lord, for those of us who do know you, may you excite us afresh and anew as to what you accomplished at the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 21. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be, the, be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow this, the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Now, when we were last together, we looked at a couple of these words there in verses 23. And following says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. We dealt with the term justified, and we dealt with the gift of grace. What we're going to look at tonight, and the two words we're going to look at and finishing this chapter, are the two words redeemed, or redemption, and propitiation. Propitiation is a word you've probably heard a lot, or if you've been in church or seen in the Bible. Hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll be able to grasp it a little bit more, and I can't wait to show it to you. But let's deal with redemption first. This term redemption is tied to the old slave market, and it meant paying the ransom to accomplish the slave's release. Now go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verses 3 through 7. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So here Paul says that Jesus was a ransom. He gave his life as a ransom. And God wants everyone to be saved. All people, it says, to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And he gave himself as a ransom. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verses 18 and 19. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the scripture says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So here again, we see the term ransom being used. We were ransomed. We were bought from our slavery by who? Jesus. By Jesus. And how did he pay for it? Blood. With his own blood. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And look at verse 45. Jesus himself said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, now we're going to deal with a question that most Christians will get wrong. So I'm not going to ask it to you and put you on the spot and embarrass you. But I'm going to ask the question and I want you to think about the answer. Who was the ransom pay price paid to? Or what was the ransom paid price paid to? Most people think that God paid Satan to set us free. Let me get this clear to you. I mean, you'd be amazed how many people think that. We weren't ransomed from Satan. We were ransomed from sin. We've been slaves to sin. Did you get it right over there? Good for you. Go to, with me to Gal Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 Look at verses 10 through 14 A lot of people think that God had to pay a price to Satan to get us free That's not the case And I'll show you some more about that in just a second Go to Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14 in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 Paul says For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So here we see, not only were we slavery to sin, we were also under the curse of the law. The law actually said that anybody that has to, wants to try to get right before God by observing the law has to keep it perfectly. And cursed is everyone who does not do it perfectly. So we were slaves to sin under the curse of the law. And Jesus went and bought us back. Go to Romans chapter 6. Look at verses 15 through 23. Romans chapter 6 verses 15 through 23. Paul says, what then, are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to every, anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, whether of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, though you, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. And having been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once pre presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, le leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members or your body parts as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. He goes on and he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you catch how many times it kept saying you were slave to sin, slave to sin, slave to sin? Jesus came and bought us back. He redeemed us from that curse that we were under the law and our sin because of our sin problem. And He bought us and He set us free to serve Him. We were slaves of sin. Now we're slaves of righteousness. I want to chase that so bad right now, but because we've got to get to so much more tonight and... Paul deals with that aspect of what we're going to get to, how we've been set free from sin and set free to serve now. Uh, uh, and 
I'm going to deal with that later on. So just keep this in mind. We're going to get to that term slaves of righteousness later on. And that the depth of it is pretty cool. When you start really understanding how you're really set free from sin. And sin has no power over you anymore. And you are now a slave to righteousness. And you have the power of Christ within you to give you victory over sin. When Christians really understand what's been accomplished at the cross... It, it, it'll blow your mind. We understand that we've been set free in the sense that we're going to heaven when we die. And it's no longer going to keep us from getting to heaven. But a lot of us still struggle with sin in this life. And anybody that says he doesn't lies. But at the same time, a lot of Christians don't fully understand the power that's available to them now that they've become slaves of righteousness. We're going to deal with that more later on. We won't deal with that tonight. But I just want you to understand, don't think for a second that God had to pay Satan's price. Who works for who? <laughs> Satan is a created being. I want to just chase this for a second. If you were to ask a lot of people today, who's the opposite of God? People would say Satan, right? Yep. Not even close. You can't say there's an opposite of God. They're not even to be compared. He's a created being. God has always existed. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. Satan's neither. He has more power than us. But he is not all-powerful. He's actually, the scripture says, a defeated foe. The Bible actually teaches us that at the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. Crushed his head. Doesn't sound like he was paying a ransom price to Satan to get us back. Because the person that got the ransom price actually comes out pretty good in the deal. Satan didn't come out good in the deal, folks. You weren't set free from Satan in the sense that Satan had power over you and the fact Jesus had to pay a price to Satan. You were set free from your problem that you had, which was sin. And that problem was leading you to death and there was no way you could get it fixed because there was nothing you could do to make yourself right. And so because of the law, you were now under a curse. And God set you free from sin and he paid the ransom price and he set you free to live for him and I want to go there but I'm not going to go there I'm just going to tell you stick around as we get into the next chapters of Romans as Paul starts to lay out how to live our lives in the power of the Spirit so we were declared righteous we saw two weeks ago you've been declared righteous you're justified you're declared just as if you'd never sinned this grace of God is a gift a free gift nothing you earn you just receive it by faith and you just say thank you and wow on top of that, you were set free and ransomed from sin and death to live a whole new life. And now we're going to get into this big word, propitiation. Go back to Romans chapter 3 again. Look at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now we're going to deal with that aspect in just a second. But he also goes on and says, This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, and it was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, we're going to deal with those two aspects in the next little bit of our study tonight. We're going to deal with the fact that God put Jesus forward as a propitiation for our sins, and he also did it at the time he did it, to show that he had passed over former sins, Yet at the same time to be the one who is just in the justifier of sins. And a lot of people have a problem with that. And hopefully by the end of the night you'll be able to grasp it a little bit more. This word propitiation is a big word with a deep meaning. It means to satisfy or to appease or to meet the requirements. Go with me to Isaiah 53. You're not going to see the word propitiation, but you're going to see the meaning of propitiation. Back, way back in, did I say Romans? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I'm to say, if you went to Romans 53, I don't want to. I want you to throw that Bible away. Go to, go to Isaiah 53 and look at verses 10 and 11. What is the definition of propitiation again? It means to do what? To satisfy or to appease? To meet the requirements? All right. Isaiah 53. Look at verses 10 and 11. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Now when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and what? Be and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Do you remember what Jesus said right before he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit? What was the thing he said right before that? No, if we're given, they don't know what they're doing. It was at the beginning of the time on the cross. He said, it is finished. To die. To tell it to tell us die is a Greek term that actually means uh, paid in full. It's done. It's been accomplished. The payment for sin had been made. By the way, that's further evidence that Jesus went to the Father. And he went straight to the Father. That's why he told the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Unfortunately, a lot of us grew up in churches that had the Apostles' Creed and said that he went down to hell for three days and then rose. If he had to suffer in hell for three days after his death, it wasn't done. It was all accomplished at the cross. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross and it was paid in full at that moment. God's requirements for sin to be paid for were satisfied at that moment. Now, false religions use this term to mean appease the anger of the gods. And man would have to do something to appease their god's anger. You know, there's a lot of false religions show that you have to do things to make the gods no ang not angry anymore. Uh, they used to burn their children and offer them to their gods to appease their anger. Or sacrifice virgins or all these things. You had to do something to appease the anger of the gods. But that's not how this word is used in scripture. And also, any teaching that says that Jesus had to appease God's anger toward mankind is a false teaching. For a lot of reasons. One of them is real clear, I hope. And that's John chapter 3, verse 16. For God was so angry at the world that he sent his son. Is that what it says? No. no. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. Alright, so listen to me, folks. Any teaching that says that Jesus was... Going on our behalf to appease God's anger toward us is bad teaching. For another reason, it has Jesus feeling one way toward us and the Father feeling a different way. That's impossible. Because they're one. Jesus wouldn't feel one way about us and the Father another. I've heard lots of preachers over the years use the courtroom scene and how the Father is the judge and, and we're the guilty people and Jesus is our defense attorney and the Father says they're guilty, they've done this, they've done that and then Jesus steps up and says, Daddy, I paid for them and the Father says, okay, they're free. That's God feeling the Father feeling one way and the Son feeling a different way. Horrible illustration. Horrible illustration. Biblically, the Bible teaches that God loves us. Now, there's a wrath toward what? Sin. And you're going to see a little later on, if you reject God's payment for your sin, you're still in your sin. And when God's wrath towards sin is going to be meted out, guess who's going to be caught in the crosshairs? You, if you're still in your sin. God's hatred is towards sin. He doesn't hate mankind. He loves mankind. But at the same time, he is a hatred, a holy hatred for sin. Go to John chapter 17. Look at verses 1 through 8. Listen to what Jesus is praying here. Right before the cross, Jesus prayed and he said, when Je It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I share this with you to show you again Jesus is saying Father I've done everything you told me to do the words I gave him are your words so when Jesus is saying God loves you and he wants you to not go to hell guess what that's the Father's words 
You want proof? Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Look at verses 6 through 10. John chapter 14, starting in verse 6. Jesus said to, to them, I am the way. He actually said this to Thomas, but they were all listening. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So again, when Jesus did what he did and said what he said, who was actually doing the speaking? The Father. You can't have any teaching that has Jesus feeling one way about you and the Father feeling another. Does Jesus love you? Yes. The Father loves you too. Even if you're lost. His hatred is towards sin. Now you say, wait a minute, Jim. I can show you lots of passages in the Bible where it says God hates the wicked. That's true. But if you do a study of the scriptures, the wicked are those who are described as the ones who reject God's offer for their sin. We're all wicked. But he loves us all. But if you stay in that condition, knowing the truth and reject it, that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that can't be forgiven. It's not covered by the blood of Jesus on the cross. And because of that, you, when you face your creator, will experience his wrath towards sin. And you're in your sin. And you're going to receive that. Go to Luke 23. Again, keep in mind who was speaking through Jesus at this time, because they both feel the same way. Luke 23, verses 32 through 43. Luke 23, starting in verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, does Jesus feel one way and the Father feel a different way? We've already shown you that the words are his words. The actions are his, the Father's actions. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Hang on for a second. Has Jesus cried out to Telestai yet? No. It hadn't been paid fully yet. But the heart of the Father toward this lost individual on the cross was, that's all I've been looking for, even in the Old Testament as well as the New, is faith in my provision for your sin. You're going to heaven. Even though the price hadn't been fully paid. People think that once the price had been fully paid, then God's anger, anger and wrath toward man has been appeased. No. The heart of the Father was being demonstrated to this man there before the payment was fully made. So again, What's being appeased? God's wrath towards sin. Folks, I, I don't have time tonight to take you to all the passages that show this, but God's wrath towards sin is serious and it must be dealt with. Go to Psalm 99. For God to ignore sin and just say, you know what, I'll just let it go. I'll just forgive you. Without there being a payment for your sin, would diminish the holiness of God? Would make God out to be a liar? Go to Psalm 99. Look at verse 8. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Isn't that interesting? 
You answered them, you, you were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. One of Becky's relatives used to say to her, I love you, I just hate your low-down ways. <laughs> God loves mankind. His hatred is towards sin. And sin is serious and must be dealt with. Years ago, when uh, that movie was made uh, about Jesus and his death, I, all of a sudden I forget the name of the Passion movie, of the Passion of the Christ, <laughs> and we went to it. And I remember coming out of that movie theater overwhelmed with what Jesus had gone through. We know that he was beaten. We know that he was crucified. We know all that. But interestingly enough, if you look at this, the gospel accounts of Jesus' death, it doesn't really get into much detail about how much blood and all this stuff. But you know he went through quite a bit for the point that he died before they had to break his legs, of course, to fill scripture and all. He went through way much more than the others did. But when it was just portrayed, and to be honest with you, and, and I really mean this, people say, oh, it was too gory, too bloody. Hang on. I don't think it was gory enough, according to the scriptures, because you could still recognize the actor who was playing Jesus. The scripture says he was beaten so badly, he was beaten beyond human recognition. But as bad as it was, as what's as we saw in the movie, I remember walking out of that theater thinking, if Jesus went through all that to take away my sin, why do I like holding on to it? That was really convicted. He went through all that to take it away. Why do I like to hold on to it sometimes? By the way, if we don't receive through faith the only way our sins can be paid for, we will still be in our sins. And we will experience God's wrath towards our sin on the day of judgment. And our judgment will be meted out in proportion to our sins. Let me read that to you again. If we do not receive through faith the only way our sin can be paid for and has been paid for, we will still be in our sins and we will experience God's wrath towards our sin on the day of judgment. And our judgment will be meted out to us in proportion to our sins. Oh, and by the way, if you've got a lot of sins... Everything you've done has been written down and you'll be judged according to what was written in the books, according to Revelation chapter 20. But on top of that, what horrific sin have you just added to your list? The unforgivable sin, which is the rejection of the Holy Spirit's call to salvation. And you trampled underfoot the blood of the covenant. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, look at verses 5 and 6. Talking to believers, again, we're going to get into this a lot more detail down the road as we start learning how to live in the power of the Spirit, not in the flesh. But put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Why is the wrath of God coming? Because of sin. It's coming. Because, again... He paid the price for sin. And for those of us who through faith receive that redemption, the propitiation, the appeasement, we enter into His grace. We're justified. But for those who reject it, and they say, I don't want that, He can't say, well, it's okay, you're covered anyway. He still has to deal with your sin because the payment for your sin was not received you still owe your bill. It's kind of like if you go and eat a meal at a restaurant, and I come up to you and say, um, I paid your bill for you. And you say, no thanks, I'll pay my own bill. Take it back. You still owe the bill. Do you understand? If you say, no, no, give him his money back, I don't want it. You still owe your bill. And his wrath is towards sin. Those who are still in their sin still owe the bill. And there's a wrath coming, folks. And if you just want a picture of it, get our book that's over there on the table about what's going to happen next during the tribulation period when Jesus starts to do what he does and the seals are opened and he comes back and he judges the world for their sin. Folks, you do realize the Bible says that this whole earth is going to be destroyed and remade over for the millennial kingdom, but destroyed because of the wrath of sin. Sin's under the, the earth is under the curse too, remember? Man was cursed. Sin was cursed. I mean, sorry, the earth was cursed. Every body of water on this earth is eventually going to turn to blood. 
Every mountain is going to be leveled. The islands are going to disappear. There's going to be a reworking of the earth and judgment that is so severe. There's going to be demons released like they haven't been. They've been there have been demon activity on the earth all throughout time. But there's going to be a demon activity during that time period that is going to be so torturous. You just you don't even want to be here. Folks, there is a judgment and a wrath of God towards sin that is coming. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Back up a couple of books from Colossians 3 and go to Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verses 1 through 8. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetous must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that's an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Again, more evidence of where we're going to be going and how to live in the spirit, not in the flesh. We've been set free from sin. Become slaves of righteousness. We have within us now the same power that rose Jesus from the dead to give us victory in these mortal bodies over sin and to live a, a life that the world will say, okay, there's something supernatural about you. You're not, even be, you're not even doing the stuff that we're doing. But unfortunately, in the church, even then, Paul was writing to Christians who have been redeemed, who have been saved, and he was saying, look, this stuff that was of your former way of life, the wrath of God is coming because of those things. Let's learn how to put them away. Let's learn how to start living in the new life. And I'm going to get into that. Again, man, I'm fighting to preaching down that road now, but I'm not going to because we're going to cover it later in Romans. But let me just say this to you. The wrath of God is coming because of sin. And if, he's, if it's coming because of sin... Why do we look like the people who are going to be wrathed, if you will? We shouldn't look like them. Go to Romans chapter 2. Look at verses 1 through 11. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up what? Wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Again, speaking to those who have not, reje not received God's offer and payment for their sin. He's been patient. He's been kind. He's, he's passed over former sins. We're going to get to that a little bit later on in our study. He's going to render to each one according to his work. So those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there'll be wrath and fury. There'll be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. So here in this section we've already studied where Paul was kind of laying out, look, um, before you start making yourself a judge of everybody else, are you a sinner too? Yes. Yeah. And he says, so keep that in mind. Because the wrath of God's coming, but he's been patient with you. His kindness is wanting to lead you to repentance. But if you reject it, the wrath of God's coming. And as we've already seen, those phrases, Jew first and also the Greek, are tied to how much was revealed to them. And the more that's been revealed to you, if you reject it, the more you'll be judged in, in comparison. So, how did Jesus' death for sin appease God's wrath towards sin? How did Jesus' death for sin appease God's wrath towards sin? Through the blood. But actually through his sinless life, his blood offered our behalf in his resurrection from the dead. It's very important, but it's the blood. But you've got to keep in mind, he kept giving a picture of the payment for sin all along. Blood had to be shed. But as the Hebrew writer said, 
if the blood of bulls and goats could actually take away sins, they wouldn't have had to keep offering them every year because they would have been taken care of. But the fact that they had to be offered over and over was God showing you this ain't fully covering it. I'll get right to you in a second. On top of that, as you're going to see later on, and we don't have time tonight, but the book of Hebrews talks about how Jesus had to be made like his brothers. He had to be like us in every way. Because man's sin, man had to die for man's sin. And so through his sinless life, through his blood on our behalf, and through his resurrection of the dead. Go ahead, you had a question. Yeah, so it's he who knew no sin. Exactly. He became sin for us. That's it. Mm -hmm. My version says forbearance, and I'm seeing through all out, like some says patience, but it goes back to forbearance, and forbearance is basically the forgiveness of debt in the legal term. Mm -hmm. So it was, he forgave our debts. Yes, he definitely forgave our debts, but someone still had to pay it. You just can't say that the debt was forgiven and no, it was not paid. It had to still be paid. Go ahead. My comments say propitiation, the mercy seat. Yes, and actually, that's a, we're gonna, we don't have time to get into that depth of it, but actually, if you look in the word, the Hebrew term of term translated propitiation, it means for mercy's sake. It's the, that part of the ark of God. So he, he, to him. Exactly. It all is pointing to, to Jesus. And we're going to take a look at script, a lot of scriptures that deal with that, but that's a great point. So let's take a look at what the scripture has to say. My prayer is that as we go through these scriptures, and we've got time, I think, to do so, we're going to have to move a little quick here, but get your pen out, because I want you to spend some time really meditating on some of these. Go to Colossians 2. You're going to start seeing this word propitiation jump off the page, and also the whole concept of Jesus' blood paying for our sins. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Look at verses 11 through 15. In him, in Jesus, you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried by, with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows what's involved in circumcision, right? There's flesh that is cut away, and then done. what, what do they usually do with it? Throw it in the trash. The flesh is cut away. And this is a picture of what is, happens to us. We are in our sin. We're fleshly. And Jesus came and circumcised us. He took our flesh and did what? Cut it off and put it away. So we would live in the newness of life. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities that had control over us. He defeated them at the cross. He met the debt. This is what you just talked about there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the debt that was against us. He paid it. He paid the debt for us. Go to Romans chapter 8. Paul gets even a little more clear here. In Romans chapter 8, look at verses 1 through 11. Now stick with me here because we're going somewhere with this. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, 
The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Look what he says. If you have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness, if you have been uh, circumcised, not done by hands, but done by the Spirit, where He took your flesh and cut it away and threw it away, you're no longer in the flesh but in the Spirit because Christ has given you His Spirit and seals you. You're in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And then he says, look, what man couldn't do because of sinful flesh, Jesus did. How come Jesus was able to live in the flesh, yet not sin? There's more than just the fact that he was God. Not more than the fact that he did what the Father told him. He had flesh just like you and me. Kind of. Oh, keep it. Got to keep this in mind here. Who was Jesus' daddy? Ooh. God. Holy Spirit. Okay. Who was Jesus' mama? Mary. So he was born of the flesh, but his father was the Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, going to shatter you, and you're going to be, have a child in you, he's going to be the child of God. This is where he was able to be a human, yet not be under the curse of sin. Because if you do a little study, we don't have time to go into that. Anybody that's got an earthly daddy and an earthly mama, the curse has been passed on to you. But Jesus had an earthly mama and a spiritual father. And therefore, he could be flesh, yet still God. And he could defeat sin in the flesh. Because that curse that nobody could get away from, he didn't have it fully. Because he was God, but he also was human. Go ahead, Bill. We're gonna we're gonna get to I do what I don't want to do and I do what I do. But I'm saying is is Jesus. Let's we'll just stick on where we're at. We're gonna get to that later on because I, I can't wait to share it with you. You're gonna start hopefully having some victory over sin because Paul deals with that in that section in chapter seven. But we're gonna get there in time. But I want you to understand is though he did what we could not do in our sinful flesh. His flesh wasn't sinful. Oh, he was tempted because it was flesh. But he wasn't born with sin like we were. We were all born with sin in us. Jesus wasn't. He lived in the spirit. But he also had the flesh. But the spirit controlled his flesh. But he didn't have sin already in him when he was born. You and I already have it in us. We don't learn it. It's not passed on to us. It's already there when we're born. That's why David says in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. He wasn't saying that she made him in the backseat of a car as a teenager or something. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't saying that. He was saying, I had sin from the moment I was conceived. Jesus did not. But go to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verses 1 and 2. Again, a long line of what you were talking about, Bill. My little children, I'm writing, the, writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the what? Propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, here we see that Jesus died for everyone, but not everyone's going to go to heaven. You either receive the gift, or you're still in your sin. But the payment was made. The appeasement for their sin has been paid. But if you say, no thanks, I'll pay it myself, take it back, you still owe the debt. And his wrath towards sin is coming in your direction. Go to 1 John chapter 4. Look at verses 9 and 10. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. In this, is, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be... What's that word again? The propitiation for our sins. In other words, the payment for our sins. That's, who, that's what Jesus has done. He's the payment for our sins. But I want to show our hands here. Let's have some honesty here. How many of you still... Because like Bill pointed out, we, like Paul, still wrestle with our flesh. We still sometimes sin when we don't want to. How many of you have thought to yourself when you do that? All right, Lord, I'll make it up to you. 
or I'll do something to make it right. I know I have. I feel like I've got to go read my Bible more or I'm going to be a little, I'll do work a little harder. When you start thinking that there's something you do need to do to make it more right with him, you're trying to sanctify yourself in the flesh. You can't. And actually, and this is hard for us to grasp, when Jesus paid for your sins, he paid for all of them. Not the ones you did before. You got saved, but all of them. And this one preacher came home one night and his wife said to him, I've heard, heard you and other preachers say for years that Jesus died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And I got no problem accepting that from the moment I trusted Jesus as a child, all the sins I committed before that he forgave. But I'm having a hard time grasping that he's really going to forgive the things I do after that. And the husband, the, the preacher said to her, when Jesus died for your sins, how many of your sins were future? They all were. The payment was made before all of our sins. So they're all forgiven. Not just the ones we did after we trusted him. Sorry, before we trusted him. They were all future when he died and paid for our sins. And when we received that payment, the payment was in full. All of our sins were already covered. That's why, by the way, a lot of the false religions and false teachers started coming in and say, Hey, you're already forgiven. You can do whatever you want. You can live in the flesh or whatever you want because you've been made alive in the spirit. Your body's still dead to sin, just like Paul said. But you can just kind of do whatever you want. It's already forgiven. Don't live for yourself. You're already in heaven. And that's what Paul's going to deal with later on. But don't let this truth sink in. If you are in Christ, you are declared righteous. The righteousness of Christ is yours right now. And God sees you that way. He's paid the full price. God is satisfied. Your sins are covered. My little children, I, I, I hope you don't sin. But if you do, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous. The one has already paid for it. When I was a younger person, and I still was learning this, and I'm still learning this now. When I would sin, I would say, oh, Lord, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. My prayer has changed now. My prayer is, thank you for Jesus. Amen. Thank you that that's already covered. I don't like the fact that I grieved you. I don't like the fact that I quenched the Spirit when I walk in the flesh and not in the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God within me is saying, i got better for you. I don't want you to live this way. I've already paid for that. Let's just get moving forward and enjoy the power that you have available. I hate that feeling, but I don't say, oh, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. It's forgiven. And I thank him for that. I thank him for that. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verses 14 through 17. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For it's surely not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make, what's, what's that word again? Propitiation. Propitiation for the sins of the people. Then he just goes on and says, because he was tempted and he suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus, again, had to become like us to become the merciful and perfect high priest. You don't put to death a dog for the sin of a human. A human had to die. And he came, lived, tempted in every way, even though many of us are tempted. None of us are tempted in every way. He was tempted in every way. He experienced every kind of temptation, yet without sin. And he paid the price. God is satisfied. And by his sacrifice, by his blood, we've been ransomed. We've been set free. And God's satisfied. God is satisfied. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We saw this earlier. We're going to keep reading a little further this time than where we left off last time. 1 Peter 1, we'll look at verses 18 through 25. 1 Peter 1, verse 18, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with the perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, 
He was foreknown before the foundation of the world was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, past tense, it's already accomplished, nor, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all is glory of the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, Jesus has declared us righteous because of his sacrifice, because of his righteousness that's been given to us. And that's been a promise from God. You've been given and purchased, given a righteousness, and purchased righteous, God purchased righteousness through a seed that's imperishable. It's, well, let me just say this to you. If you have Christ Jesus in you, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. <laughs> that's just the way the scripture is. If you have been sealed by him, Jesus himself said, I will lose none that the Father has given me. Oh, he even says, there's lots who say, Lord, Lord, but they're not in. But you remember, those who said, Lord, Lord, when they tried to get in, they say, didn't we do? Didn't we do? Well, their faith wasn't in Jesus. Their faith was in their works. And a lot of Christians today will think, well, I believe in Jesus and I'm a good Christian. Good luck. Because that and is a problem. Does God want us to do good works? Yes. But if we think that's even tied to us being declared righteous in the eyes of God, or he's given us more points because we've done good compared to other Christians who aren't going to Wednesday night prayer service, well, you got a problem. That is sanctimonious. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verses 11 and following. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. We'll go to verse 28. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that had come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, not that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, before we read any further, when Jesus offered his blood, when his blood was shed on the cross, he said it's paid in full to tell us die. What's the next thing he says? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Hebrews now tells us, where did he go? He went into the Holy of Holies, the temple that's really in heaven. The one that's on earth was just a picture of the one that's in heaven. And he went into that one with his own blood on our behalf. If the blood of bulls and goats can cover your flesh for a little bit, how much more will the blood of Jesus through his eternal spirit offer once for all cover you? Go to verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you and in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship indeed under the law almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood not his own. 
For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, I don't know how many of you noticed in the last two passages that I read, there were references made to God's patience with man's sin. Yet a serious dealing with sin had to be made. Did you catch it? He was saying that there, all those sacrifices that the law said were a picture of who? And in the mind of God, he was sacrificed before the foundation of the world, but made manifest in these last days for your sake. In other words... God's plan all along that the payment was that the payment for sin was going to be him, himself in the form of his son. Taking on human form, living without sin, dying in our place. It's been that way all along. All the other stuff was pointing to that time. If you remember back as we read in, in our last other verse there in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 again. Go back and look at it real quick. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 and following, you're going to see a picture of what Paul's talking about in, first, in Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 20. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but it was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Go back to Romans 3. Look at verse 24. We're all justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, Jesus' death was planned before the foundation of the world and the mind of God was already done because God sees it all as, as now. But in our, for our sake, it was made manifest, for our sake, especially for the people on this side of the cross. But all those people of the Old Testament, the only way they ever could be given righteousness was by what? Faith. Faith. Back to Abraham, it was given him. Before he was even circumcised, he was declared righteous because of his faith in God's promise. Listen, all along, the fact that God let people live even, because of their sin until the time of Christ shows his patience his forbearance but it had already been paid for in the mind of God so when Abraham believed God God gave him righteousness why because in the mind of God Jesus already paid for his sin do you understand it it happened in time 2,000 years ago now it happened in time for our people on our site say that we can see that but in the mind of God it's already been done and it's always been by faith. But he not only prior had given people righteousness because he knew that Jesus' death was going to cover it. He also showed it publicly. He was manifest. He was put forward. All these terms are being used in the Bible. So that God would display that he was the one who is just and the one who's a justifier of people's sins. In other words, God can't just say, ah, it's forgiven. He shows you the seriousness of it through the cross of Jesus and that he was the one who paid for it, no one else. He did it himself. What did Jesus say? No one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to raise it up. By the way, if you ever dealt with people that are dying, there's a dying process and a death rattle. Jesus didn't have a death rattle. He was actually talking coherently right up to the end. Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. And he was gone. They went to break the legs of everybody to speed up their death. It's interesting to me that the Bible says that they went and broke the legs of one of the thieves. And then they went and broke the legs of the other thief. By the way, where was Jesus? In the middle. Wouldn't you, if you're breaking legs, go boom, boom, boom? But these guys, even though they're acting all tough, even knew there's something different about this guy. I'm going to hold off to the last moment to get this guy's legs. They broke legs, went around Jesus, broke the other guy's legs. They go back to break his, and he was already gone. Did he die? Yes, he died. It was a real death. 
His spirit was separated from his body. His spirit went to be with the Father, but it was intentional. Man didn't do it. He laid his life down. Same picture we see with Isaac being willing to lay down on that altar when Abraham was going to sacrifice him because the Father said so. So if we're made righteous through faith in Jesus' righteousness, and all we bring to the table in this interaction is our sin, do we have anything to boast about? Nope. We don't have anything to boast about in anything we've done, but in everything that he's done. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1, first, later on you can look at it, we don't have time tonight, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 30, Paul says, if you're going to boast, boast in the cross. If you're going to brag about anything, boast in the cross. Because God's going to use the foolishness of man, uh, the foolishness of God to confound, his wisdom to confound man's wisdom as well. His, what seems foolish to us is God's wisdom. And he's done it on purpose. You're never going to figure it out intellectually. And he says, think about what many of you were. You weren't that impressive. But if you've got anything to boast about, boast in the cross. So I'm going to challenge you as we start moving forward and come back next week. Watch and listen for, but I. And ask God to remove that desire within you to justify yourself in any way. But I've worked hard. But I've, but be willing to just lay yourself down for the plan of God in your life. And you'll start to experience the victory over the flesh and the power of the spirit. But more on that when we come back together. I love you. We'll see you next week.